Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and get this started. Alright, first question. If good morning max is way below squat and deadlift, should I shift the focus more towards good mornings? Uh, no, not necessarily. Here's, here's what I mean with that. I have lifters who have weak low backs and weak hamstrings who have decent squats and deadlifts. Okay? who have relatively weak good mornings. We don't stop progressing on the squat and the deadlift. right? We don't take any focus away from it. I'm going to recommend that you don't train the squat and the deadlift any less than you do now. What I'm going to recommend is that you shift your supplemental volume more towards a good morning. Okay? Because how do we build the maxes? Do, do, you, do you really think you're going to build the max good morning? By doing just max good mornings? No, not really. Now you could test it more often if it has room to grow. And there's certainly nothing wrong with, with maxing a little more on a good morning if you know it has a lot of room to improve and you're pushing it really hard with the rep work. Right? It has a lot of room to improve. If it's dramatically lower than your squat and your deadlift, you probably don't need any supplemental work for the good morning either. The good morning itself will just go up by doing it. So you need to push the good mornings harder. You need to push the good mornings harder. What does that mean? Get your 10 rep maxes up quicker. And I might even suggest that you stop sandbagging them. Because one of the things that a lot of lifters do who know their max, because again, you're maxing on good mornings. And for people who are new to my channel, are like, well, what is he talking about? Because I promote generally conjugate training. It's what I promote. It's what I use. It's what I program for most of my clients. Not all but the majority. Well, we max on good mornings. We max on a couple of lifts every single week on the own conjugate type systems. Good morning is one of the lifts we max on. But here's what I would say. Make sure that you're not sandbagging on your, your rep work. In other words, when you go to do your volume on the good morning, because you're not going to be doing speed work on it, I hope, Make sure that your 10 rep sets are 70%. Make sure that your 5 rep sets are 80%. In other words, if you have a, a max good morning of 300 pounds, just throwing that out there, because you said that it's weak, so I'm going to say 300 pounds is a weak good morning squat, or a good morning max, right? I would classify that as weak. Anything under 400 pounds is a weak good morning for a grown man with a strength base. So, say it's 300. If you're doing 10s with 150 pounds, you're not pushing the good morning very hard. That's why you're weak at it. Does that make sense? You'd be doing 70%. You need to be doing 200 plus pounds for sets of 10. Okay, or else your max is not going to go up. So that's what I mean by pushing it harder. Push it harder on the rep work and make sure you're using appropriate percentages to work off of those maxes. Since you're already maxing on the good morning, you have data to work with. You know exactly what you need to be doing for rep work in order to progress. So get in and do it. Fix it. All there is to it. All right, next question. At what point would you pick seal rows slash chopper rows over penley rows in your program? Also, do you still advocate the supinated position on a pen lay row, sir? Uh, no, I don't, I don't advocate the supine position. I feel like it's too much of a bicep risk for most people. I'm not saying it couldn't be done for some variation from time to time, but I don't generally advocate it, right? Hopefully that makes sense. I don't generally advocate it, uh, but again, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not terrible. Over to question about seal rows versus chopper rows. I don't, I don't know what a chopper row is. Uh, my understanding of a seal row is, is again, a chest supported row on a bench to where you flop to cheat a little bit. That's why they call it the seal, because the seal flops along the ground. So you kind of flop and cheat a little bit. Uh, which, again, lets you do a little bit more weight than a strict chest supported row. I don't, I don't know that that's any better than a chest supported row, to be honest. It's just strict. But when would I pick one over the other? Well, I'm doing chest supported rows right now. 
when would we do chest supported rows when we need to continue to row but we don't want any stress on the low back as for a lot of lifters i like to do a lot of base building with the pin leg row y trains us to contract isometrically while pulling off of the floor this can carry over to a stronger start position on the conventional deadlift so the the pin leg row can be a valuable tool for strengthening our isometric strength at the start position of a conventional deadlift. In other words, it can help improve your deadlift. However, we also reach points in our training to where our total low back work starts to really, really mount up. So let's take what I'm doing, for example. Uh, I'm hitting a training max on a squat and a deadlift twice a week, and then I do volume with squats, then I do volume with heavy good mornings twice a week. That's a lot of low back work. I also have a reverse hyper, so any extra low back work that I want that can be restorative, I can work in. I don't necessarily benefit, and it can actually be counterproductive to do a bunch of pulling with rows the day before I have to deadlift. It can be counterproductive. Therefore, I choose to do a chest supported row uh, at this time, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, and neither one is right or wrong. It's not a case of saying, hey, a pen lay row is better or a chest supported row is better. Simply looking at what's going on with the totality of your training programming, looking at your overall fatigue and which one that you would benefit from the most right now in your training. Uh, but I would generally say for more novice lifters, uh, the pen lay row is going to be superior. I generally am probably not going to do very, very often pull out pin lay rows for a chest supported movement for, for any male lifter who's pulling less than 500 pounds, right? And I have plenty of guys pulling 500 plus who still do pin lay rows at least twice a week. So it really comes down though to what's going on in your overall training and the fatigue that's happening and you know how strong you are, how much you're having to load and compress your spine with your other lifts. All right, next question. Do you have any tips for especially but not exclusively beginners to find their most powerful squat stance for the back squat? I've heard several different idea and drills for this, but I'm just curious if you have anything different personally. Well, it doesn't really matter where you're at as a beginner, does it? You need to just go to a wider stance. If you haven't built up a really strong narrow stance and you're, and you're weak at the wide stance still, you have nothing to lose by going with a slightly wider stance. Get out shoulder width or wider, outside of shoulder width ideally. Now, what's my solution with dealing with clients? We don't have to deal with these problems. If I put all of my lifters on box squats from day one and I can supervise them and look at their footage and teach them how to box squat correctly, this problem completely goes away. Why? Because we can squat real wide on the box. It's easier to develop a wide squat on the box squat. It's more forgiving. It allows us to develop a wider stance squat. Why does that matter? Because being strong at wide carries over better to narrower than narrower does out to wide. In other words, we're generally with a wider stance, a reasonably wide stance up to a threshold, we're going to involve more muscles and we're oftentimes gonna be stronger once we have developed all the musculature. If we get really strong with a wide stance squat, we can squat narrow easily. We can just pull our, our stance in and we're going to be pretty dang strong without training it. It doesn't work the other way around because of the muscles involved. If you get really strong at a narrow stance squat, it will not always carry over anywhere near to the same degree that the other direction does. So you might actually end up being very weak at a wider stance and therefore you're weakest at the, the squat stance that allows you to move the most weight, use the most muscles. You know, you can't move the most weight then because you're weaker due to the muscles being weaker and smaller. A lot of the, the uh, other muscles involved. My advice, what I do, we learn to box squat and then when we pull the box, after we've developed a respectable box squat, if we pull the box out and back squat, we go with the widest stance that we can hit parallel with. Take the widest stance which your structure will allow you to reach parallel with, and that's your squat stance. And then you build that up. 
All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.